So my name is D'Angelo Platt Friday. I am from DC and I'm a journalist and a TV producer. Yeah, D'Angelo, my name is Leslie and I am from Chateau on the South Side and okay. I work in intercultural development for a university. What was the biggest holiday for your family and how was it celebrated? Hmm. What was the biggest holiday for your, for your family? That's a good question. You know, we were not big, uh, holiday celebrators. Uh, I remember feeling a lot of hope during Christmas time. Um, so Christmas was just a special time of, you know, I remember going to the grocery store and seeing the Salvation Army um, outside the grocery store. When I think about Christmas, we um, had people over. I remember opening presents with um, family members. And so that was a really, um, special time. When I think about my childhood, Christmas was always a highlight. Um, and as we got older, child, we start opening gifts later and later. <laughs> so like midnight, like yeah. <laughs> everyone was kind of over the presents. Since. And then I started wanting to really get deeper into, um, you know, we could get in conversations about the accuracy of Christmas and theologically, mm -hmm. you know, and so I started wanting to provide some significance for that for my family and go in deeper ways. And so that was interesting <laughs> doing that. Like, here's my gift. Let's talk yes, about this. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So I'm like, okay, let's turn to Luke. <laughs> and my family was like, girl, <laughs> chill, we try to relax. Um, so yeah, Christmas, Christmas was big. Um, what about you? Um, it certainly wasn't, we wasn't really opening the Bible on Christmas. Um, well, sometimes, but I think when I was younger, that's when my mom, because it was just my mom and me and my brother, she would go hard on Christmas because I don't think she really got that growing up. Um, but my favorite memory outside of the actual presents is she would wrap uh, the presents in these newspapers with comics and stuff on it. So nice. we were the, I was, me and my brother were the rare ones who wouldn't like just tear it open. We like read the comics and like, have those little moments and then we tear the tear the gifts open and mm. and get uh like some pretty cool gifts but um christmas mm -hmm. definitely for me too was 100 mm -hmm. percent like a big holiday because i get to get stuff and i don't have to go to school and all those type of things so yeah you know d'angelo when i think about holidays i feel like our generation we have like this whole like deconstruction mm. space mm -hmm. value um and I, as you were talking i thought about july 4th and just even getting older and realizing, do I want to celebrate July 4th? Yeah. And, you know, but people have good cookouts and the food is, you know, <laughs> good. Yeah. And so it wanted to be a fellowship. But I think about so much of my disorientation has happened with all of the holidays that are um, praised within America as a black woman. Mm. Now I'm looking back and saying, oh, do I want to celebrate Thanksgiving? Do I want to celebrate the 4th of July? Right. You know, what's up with Christmas? You know, so. You start uh, to learn the history of yeah, everything and you get turned yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, And then, you know, within black culture, it's so interesting because we're, we're not of the same opinion. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's some black folk who like, girl, come on, yeah. <laughs> you're coming to my house for this cookout. I'm not right. trying to hear the history of this. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's some people like, are you really gonna go out tonight? Right. Like, do you know what happened on this day? Right. So it's, it's a struggle for me when I think about holidays in America. That's interesting. I feel like holidays for, for a lot of people are just kind of a getaway, like a break of the rhythm, a time mm -hmm. to rest. Mm -hmm. And it's not always about mm -hmm. what the holiday represents. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if we think about it, like even growing up in Columbus Day existed and mm -hmm. like how problematic that is. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of Thanksgiving. <laughs> There's yes. so many yes. holidays that are just like, uh, it just shows you the, uh, how America can, America can rewrite the history of so many things yes. to make it seem like a W when it's actually a very ugly aspect to it mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a black man, D'Angelo, do you feel heard? And the same question for Leslie, do you feel heard? Just in life in general? Or? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I could jump in. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll ask you. Okay. So, I'm wondering, as a as a black woman, do you do you feel heard by society? Absolutely not. Yeah, I think um, black women we are going through. We've always been going through a lot, but I think specifically at this moment in history, I think. You know, whatever was happening pre-pandemic, I think it all exploded. Mm. And so I remember watching um, the verdict for Breonna Taylor and the police officers. And, you know, D'Angelo, I was working from home during that year. And I remember um, being on a staff meeting on a Zoom call, and I'm looking at the television, and I'm like, oh, this this is just going to go down like it normally goes down mm -hmm. in America, mm -hmm. justice system. Mm -hmm. And I'm like wiping away tears, turning off my camera on Zoom, and trying to act like I'm okay, and going back and forth in that moment. And I remember feeling like, yeah, we're not heard and we're not seen. And, you know, I usually, I expect that from white people, to be honest, mm -hmm. but I felt like our black brothers were not necessarily, I didn't, I don't want to say y'all because I didn't know you at that point, but y'all didn't show up mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. The way I wanted you mm -hmm. all to show up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying every black man, but I'm saying that was the general sense right. that I felt in that moment. And so to answer your question, I don't feel like as a black woman I'm hurt in America. What about you? What would you say to that? Um, I, can, I can connect with that too because I also I had one of my friends, a black woman, she, it, it's so interesting, everything that's happened, like George Floyd, and a lot of it was like, for a long time, America would not own the unequal treatment of like police officers towards black men. So it was like, mm -hmm. so like, oh, like finally, society is coming to terms with its sins, at least mm -hmm. acknowledging, right? Mm -hmm. And it felt like so, such a, such a, a validation mm -hmm. in some sense, but then you forget that also black women are like fully experiencing that same type mm -hmm. of bias. Mm -hmm. And like, wow, we're, I'm getting that validation as a black man. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. that for a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until in that moment that my friend kind of called me out on that, that I realized, mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's very true. And like, just mm -hmm. like there is the George Floyds and mm -hmm. all those, there's the Breonna Taylors as well. And mm -hmm. that's also not out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. I think it was, it's funny how you can be in the middle of something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And and finally, you know, you've been experiencing injustice, mm -hmm. so you're happy that the, uh, that that is validated. Mm -hmm. But then you're also kind of doing the same thing to another group by also mm -hmm. not validating or or bringing them up with you. And I I agree that that happened. Mm -hmm. And I think um, mm -hmm. having that posture of like just being okay with being wrong and like having people who will hold you accountable in your circle is like. Mm -hmm like vital, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. yeah. I appreciate you for saying that, you know, and when George Floyd happened, I felt like, unfortunately, I feel like with so many acts of injustice, you need like a case study mm. to prove the validation of a people's oppression. And I felt like with George Floyd, it was, you can't deny this. Right. So many other cases, Trayvon Martin, you can, we can go down the list, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But with George Floyd, it sparked a global movement. 100%. And so there was no turning back. There was I shouldn't say that. There were people who were. People were always yeah, people, yeah, yeah, but it was like this moment where, okay, this is this happened. Right. And, you know, I think as a black woman, we, we often feel the tension of we have to protect black men and we have to, I feel like we're trying to show our, prove our loyalty to you mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. in so many ways. And I feel like that comes at the cost of admitting our pain. And so, you know, I probably wouldn't have this conversation with many black men because I feel like there would be a sense of, girl, we the ones that, that's really out here, like, you know, driving right. while, while black, you right. know, if it's between me and you, right. I know that you're at a greater risk right. if we're in the car together. Right. And so I, think, I feel like we have this, um, this tension, this weight, this burden that we carry as black women of if I acknowledge my pain, what does that do for you? Yeah. Yeah, I um, it's just hard, and it, and we could look at the dynamic right between black men and black women, but a lot mm -hmm. of the division that intention that we have is 
so reflective of the pressure that society is putting on us mm -hmm. and the injustices that we're experiencing. And, mm -hmm. and I, I had a conversation with my father about this, and he's very passionate about this. He's 60 years old, and he just felt like black men were targeted more mm -hmm. than in, in society just growing up, especially mm -hmm. him being 60, 60 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that kind of loses the point. It's mm -hmm. not a who is yes. experiencing it harder or who's, who's having a harder time. I think it's just like yeah. it's we're both experiencing it, and how can we both extend that love and compassion to one another mm -hmm. and use that uh, to move forward? Yeah, yeah. Like we don't have like a tally board, like how many points do right. you have right. and like whose pain is greater? Mm -hmm. Like pain is pain, mm -hmm. like period. Yeah. Yes. Um, but to your point, mm -hmm. I, of course, not, I don't want to say of course, but no, I don't feel seen as a black man. I think even in what we just talked about, the George Floyd situation and like the um, injustices in our interactions with police officers, it's like not everybody is having this great awakening mm -hmm. of something that like we've been screaming for generations. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's crazy to me. Like that's what, it, that's what needed to happen for you guys to understand that this has been happening. Like why aren't you understand, like why aren't you receiving my voice when I say that this is happening and I'm experiencing this, like, mm -hmm. why do you need all of those things? Why do you need years and years, Rodney King? Like, it's not like mm -hmm. George Floyd was the first one, like Rodney mm -hmm. King, like all these type of things to happen. Mm -hmm. And then what are you actually going to do as opposed to like, sometimes I feel like it's just symbolic things that are being done in response. Mm -hmm. And it's like just social media, like, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, like it, it's showy. Yeah. We're in a very showy culture and society and it's like, well, how, what can we do? I'm 29 now. What can we do so that my son mm -hmm. will not have the same type of experience that I had mm -hmm. um, or that my father had? Mm -hmm. D'Angelo, if you don't mind, like, can you, can you walk me through what the moment of George Floyd communicated to you? Like, I feel like we, we see these traumatic events, but like they're messages that we receive from those events. Yeah, that's interesting because you get so used to something that you're very numb to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was until I saw that other people were reacting to that I was like, oh, like, what do I feel? Because mm -hmm. I'm so mm -hmm. used to this. This is like, I'm seeing this story and it's like, that's normal. Yeah. Uh, and you just get numb to it. You mm -hmm. kind of withdraw from it because it's just like, well, this is actually very overwhelming. I don't know what to do with this. From what I see, no one else is going to do anything about this, but I kind of need to move forward. Uh, mm -hmm. So. I think for me, it affirmed in me that I can have an emotional response to this, yeah. uh, feel that, and like live in that, yeah. which is hard. So, yeah. yeah. How about for you? Yeah. Um, I feel like George Floyd. I, I feel like you know I've been in this process of um, I went to a predominantly white evangelical college and seminary. And so I have been reared in whiteness. And so, and when I say that, I feel like I have been taught to think of those issues as the first thought that comes to mind is what did they do wrong? And I feel like that is antithetical to mm. the Imago Dei of we were created in God's image, mm. period. So, um, when I see a traumatic event like that, my first response should be that of seeing what happened mm. and not necessarily thinking about what went wrong and what happened. Mm. And so I feel like I've been on this journey of unlearning whiteness and really stepping more into being the black woman that God created me to be. It's mm. beautiful. You're not right, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You could be wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you condemned. Mm -hmm. It just means you're wrong. Yeah. And let's move forward from that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to say just period. I feel like um, I feel like white people need to be reintroduced to Jesus 
and reintroduced to the story of God. And I feel like the way the gospel has been presented has been whitewashed. And so I feel like if I could tell anything to white people, I would say there's a lot that you need to unlearn. Yeah. That's good. Final question. Do you have hope for racial reconciliation? Do you feel, do you, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I got my answer already. Do you have hope for racial reconciliation? Child number one, how are we define a racial reconciliation? That's number one. And based on how you define that, if racial reconciliation includes action, then yes, I do have hope for hmm. racial reconciliation. What about you? Okay, so <laughs> I think it's just, it's no, I don't think I do. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I'm a pessimist. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like that innately people need to, they thrive by having someone at the top and someone at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's just what makes people feel good. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where Western, at least the Western world where it was, that's white people. And like, that's the principles that a lot of things were built on innately. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I ever believe that that will be completely deconstructed. Mm. But um, so I, I guess I don't have hope, but mm -hmm. I also don't think that means that I'm not going to do anything and going to sit here and like mm -hmm. um, stay immobile or stay mm -hmm. inactive. Mm -hmm. It's just that yeah. I don't think that I don't know. We're you know we're born into sin, and, you know that's just part yeah. of the realities of the world, and I don't think that we'll ever really fully get past that. Yeah, you know, D'Angelo, I remember as a child reading and learning about history, and I would learn about these atrocities and think like, how could they not do anything? Like, how could people live and go about daily life and not respond to the problems of their day? And what keeps me going on racial reconciliation um, is that I feel like our kids and our grandkids are going to ask us, what did you do? Right. Where were you? And I feel like in order to have a clear conscience for them, I want to show up. Yeah, 100%. Period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>